this is a takeoff on where in the world is Carmen San Diego. I don't care, but I do care where Antichrist is. And you see pictured here, who is that? Waldo. Waldo. Of all the books, and you search through to all the people to find Waldo, well, he's out in the open here. Where is Waldo pictured? He's at the beach. Here's a reason for that. Um, in your booklets, you have a, um, a paper I prepared, Where in the World is Antichrist? Now, a lot of Christians will tell you Antichrist is going to appear from Europe. He will emerge from Rome, from France, different um, countries, but they say Europe. Is that what the Bible says? No. Even people who are not familiar with uh, any religion, per se, they've heard of Antichrist. They know he's some evil villain that appears at the end of this age. And that may be about all they know about him. But almost every religious culture has a form of Antichrist. In the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, have depictions of Antichrist. For Jews, it's Armillus, who in the ancient writings is a spawn of Satan, a, a literal biological descendant of Satan that will give tremendous trouble to the nation of Israel at the end of this age. Sadly, mainstream Judaism doesn't believe in our Armillus anymore. They think, well, we're back in our country, we're restored, things are great, um, all of that's in the past. But that leaves them blinded to what the future holds. What do the prophets say about that? Well, Isaiah said, blind yourselves and be blind. You don't know that you've killed your Messiah and now a false um, Savior will come to you. You will put your trust in man rather than in God and they will sign a false peace with him. Christianity, and when I refer to Christianity, it's a lot like um, the old Jewish saying where there are three Jews in a room, you have at least five opinions. Christianity is like that too. So when I say Christianity in a blanket sense, I mean this is what the Bible says, and I'll give you scripture for it. Christianity says that this evil, villainous individual skilled in deception will appear at the end of this age, have worldwide influence, and cause tremendous destruction for God's people. Joe started talking about the time of Jacob's trouble and how when... Uh, Pontius Pilate washed his hands of the situation and said, I find no guilt in, in this man. What do you want me to do with him? What did they say, Joe? Crucify. Crucify him and let his blood be upon us and the heads of our children. Those are the living descendants alive today, the Jews of this world today, the time of Jacob's trouble. Hosea, the prophet, tells us that blood guilt is upon them and that at the time of the end, they'll have to be punished for that. It's a, it's a terrible thing. Now, how do we figure in on that? We're grafted in as Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Does that mean, Barbara, that you're just there for the good times? I want to be, but you cannot be an heir according to the promise just for the good times. If you're God's people, well, then you're God's people. And you're going to have to make a decision 
of who to worship. And the Bible tells us about that. Now, Islam has an antichrist figure also. It's called Dajjal, D-A-J-J-A-L. And we'll talk more about Islamic eschatology tomorrow. But it's very, very similar to Christian eschatology, or it appears to be. We'll talk about that. But their Dajjal, or Antichrist, is really an anti-Mahdi, because they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the prophet, but Mahdi, M-A-H-D-I, is their chosen one, the twelfth Imam, um, the one who will come to establish a kingdom, a perfect religious kingdom upon this earth. Sounds familiar, but their kingdom is, the, is a caliphate. It's um, with Sharia law. It would be in direct opposition to Jesus Christ and our messianic kingdom. But, but it's in their eschatology that we'll talk about tomorrow. Now, where in the world does he come from? And I think it's interesting that here on Friday the 13th, we're talking about Revelation 13. If you're not familiar with Revelation 13, that's where most of your description about the false prophet and Antichrist come from. Now, Daniel is a, is a phenomenal prophet. All the prophets talk about him. But what does it say in the very first verse of Revelation 13? And that's all we'll have time for tonight is the first verse. But notice Daniel wrote about this guy. John, Daniel is the Old Testament apocalyptic writer. And then John is the New Testament apocalyptic writer. And um, John says, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Now, if we go back to 12.9, it tells us who the dragon is, the serpent of old, he who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the world, is the dragon. The dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. And that's not Waldo, that's Antichrist. Um, when we look at the sand of the seashore, what does that symbolize? Well, it can. It is people. Abraham's seed. That's who that is. Um, if we read, and I've cited four or five uh, references here that talk about the sand of the seashore. Um, Genesis, the 22nd chapter, says, um, I will greatly bless you, Abraham. I will greatly multiply your seed as the sand which is on the seashore. In the 32nd chapter of Genesis, God promises Abraham, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, says that Abraham will have as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Genesis 17 says, I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Today, there are a multitude of nations in the Middle East, all directly descended from Abraham. Iran is not, but most of the other nations are. Muhammad was a direct descendant of Abraham through Ishmael. How many sons did Abraham have? 
He did have more than two. He had at least 10. We don't know the exact number, but he had a minimum of 10 sons. All in his old age. All have tons of descendants. Ishmael has the 12 tribes of Ishmael, just like um, his grandson Jacob had the 12 tribes of Jacob. There are at least 10 sons of Abraham, all with descendants that are innumerable, just like the sand of the seashore. Now, when the Bible speaks of the sea, it talks about people, but it's always Gentiles. And it shows this beast coming up out of the sea. Now, the dragon standing with Abraham's descendants at the sand of the seashore and coming up out of the sea of Gentiles among Abraham's descendants is this beast who is Antichrist. He's not from Rome. He's not from Europe. He's from the Middle East. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority, a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies to make war with the saints. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written in the book of life. His influence will be tremendous. Here's the key. You have to love truth and keep your name from being blotted out in the book of life to not be deceived. Let's back up to um, the prophet Daniel, my very favorite prophet. I love all the prophets, but Daniel holds a special place in my heart. He gives us so much information, and I was delighted when Dr. Joe brought out um, Daniel 9, that's my favorite chapter in the Bible. Um, it, it has a, a really deep, precious meaning for me. But 500 years before Christ was born, Daniel prophesied about two horns, the large horn and the small horn. What does horn always symbolize in Scripture? Power. A king, a nation, power. It's, it's power. The large horn has now become a part of world history. Just like Dr. Joe said, Daniel 2 is World History 101. It will tell you just the brief outline of world history. You don't even have to take the class. There it is in one chapter. It really is. It's, I made an A in world history. I loved it. I grew up loving history. I would read um, encyclopedias. I would read biographies, anything about the past. I just, I loved it when I was growing up. Now, I don't want to mislead you. I read those things when I wasn't at a party because I did like to party too, so... I know you can't believe that about me, Joe, but no way. I, I know, shocker. And I was not as sedate in my youth as I am now. So, but I did love history, and I had no idea that that was preparation to study prophecy. Because you see, prophecy is history, but told in advance. Prophecy is God's plans, and what God has decreed will be done. And it's like an ark all the way across. This has been fulfilled. That's history. What has yet to be fulfilled is still prophecy, but it one day will be fulfilled exactly as written. Now, when Daniel prophesied about the large horn and the small horn, the large horn now has become a major part of history. He is Alexander the Great, the world conqueror. He 
foretold this 200 years before he came on the scene. But he gave us a very interesting um, bit of information we don't find in the other prophets. He said, when this large horn, the first king of Greece, and Alexander united all the little Greek city-states into one country, became a world conqueror, went on to uh, conquer the known world at the time, and then was dead by age 32 or 33 in Babylon because he had accomplished the prophecy. But Daniel said his kingdom will not go to his heirs of his body it will be divided four ways. Well, history tells us, yes, his kingdom was divided by his warring generals. Cassander got um, Macedonia. Ptolemy got Egypt. Lysimachus got Asia Minor or Turkey. And then the eastern part, the Assyrian region, went to um, Antigonus's son, Seleucus and that became the Seleucid Empire. Then if we turn over to Micah 5, we, we just know that Antichrist is going to come from one of those four divisions of Alexander the Great's empire. Micah 5 tells us when Christ returns, and that's Micah 5, 2 through 6, when Christ returns, he will deliver us from the Assyrian. So there's your, your division that he comes from. Today, the Assyrian region, that eastern region of Alexander the Great's empire, is composed of Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, and parts of Turkey, and a little, little bit of Israel. There's where Antichrist will appear. From among the descendants of Abraham, Tomorrow we will go into eschatological um, beliefs held by Islam and compare those to our beliefs about the last days and who those three characters are. Who are the three main characters in our end time prophecies? Yes, I'm talking exactly about the beast, the false prophet, and then who shows up at the end? Jesus, Jesus Christ. You get more candy when you leave. <laughs> well, good. Store it away from me. I'll eat it. Those are the three main characters. Now, we know we have two witnesses that appear before that. We know all of that. But the three main characters at the end or the beast or antichrist, the false prophet, his sidekick, cohort, and then Jesus Christ who returns to establish the messianic kingdom of God here on the earth. Now, in Islam, what are the three main characters? Now, you, you don't get their prophecy in the Quran. We'll talk about that tomorrow. It's in the Hadith. Do you say Hadith? Okay, in the Hadith, which is second only, it's a book that's second only to the Quran, and it has their prophecy. And it says, their Mahdi will arrive, M-A-H-D-I, that's the chosen one, the twelfth Imam, the one they believe will come and establish the kingdom or the last caliphate kingdom, the Islamic kingdom on this earth and set up Sharia law. There are all sorts of prophecies about him. Iran has already paved a highway in honor of his arrival. They put their money where their mouth is, where their belief is. They've already paved a highway for him. Um, and then their second character is Isa, their word for Jesus the prophet. They believe that God has no son, that Jesus is a prophet of God. He was not crucified. He did not die. But Allah has called him to stand beside him until the Mahdi arrives. And then God, Allah will send Isa, 
Jesus the prophet to tell the Christians how we all got it wrong. And tomorrow we'll talk more about that, but that's his role. And then they believe Dajjal shows up, who is an evil villain at the end time. They are anti-Mahdi, like we would say anti-Christ. Um, they believe that their Mahdi, with his massive army, will defeat Dajjal. And if you turn to Revelation 19, you might read about that very same battle. But our version, it turns out differently. Their Dajjal is our Jesus Christ. So um, know and understand what they believe, what they anticipate. Know and understand what your Bible anticipates. Do you believe it? Well, then familiarize yourself with it. Peter says, um, now is the time to uh, fill your mind with understanding, with knowledge. Not when it's too late. Know ahead of time what to expect, what the prophets tell us will happen, so that when it happens, you may believe. Joe talked about... Um, the restoring of the nation of Israel. You know, there was 2,000 years when there was no Israel on a world map. Israel disappeared. Judah hung around. They had a civil war, much like us. The South was a little bit better. Judah got to last a little bit longer, but they got wiped out too. The prophets foretold that Israel would be reborn. We have seen that. That happened before I was born. It happened since some of you have been born. Um, 1948, Israel, those dry bones came to life again. Much prophecy is dependent upon Israel being back in place. More prophecy is dependent upon their temple being rebuilt. Now, who's going to build the temple? Are we going to build it? No, we don't need a temple. We have Jesus Christ. That veil was rent in two from top to bottom. We have access 24-7 through Jesus Christ to God. But who does not accept Jesus? The Jews as a whole. They are going to build it. They are in readiness. When you talk to the Temple Institute in Jerusalem and other authorities, it's ready. And they don't keep all their eggs in one basket. All over the world are um, artifacts ready to be used in the temple. The building blocks are ready. The blueprints are in Ezekiel. It's ready. What are they lacking to build that temple? It's not funding. It's not plans. They're training the priests right now. You can go on YouTube and watch them training. I, I like YouTube, too. I just go from YouTube to YouTube. You can see them training the priest and their sons. They take the little lamb and they... They stroke it, and then they slit its throat. It's, and then I change to another YouTube thing because I don't like that. But they, te they teach them how to do it on a farm because they're not allowed to do it on the uh, temple area now. When the spot for the temple is granted in this false covenant that they will sign with Antichrist, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow because in Islamic um, eschatology, it talks about the um, seven-year agreement. And our Bible talks about that final seven that Joe mentioned tonight. Um, we're all using the same textbook in this room, so 
know and understand what it says, love truth, search the scriptures for truth, know what's true. Do you see a lot of people who just live for truth today? I do not. I see political correctness, which is just another word for deception. You can't say what you really mean, so you, you deceptively use political correctness. And that's what's acceptable now. It used to be you had Catholics, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and everybody knew what they believed. Now it doesn't much matter. They say, well, you know, your truth is my truth. Is it really? Because I don't think it's my truth. It may be Joe's truth, but it's not my truth. Um, I get my truth from the Bible. And if it's not there, well, it must not be true. Now, that's, you have to make that decision. That's where I, I get my information. Not from any other person's opinion. It comes from the Bible. Now, that's up to you to decide where your truth comes from, where your information comes from. That's a decision. You're going to have to decide in the end times, do you want your reward now? In this life? Or do you want it eternal life in the kingdom? Because you may not be able to have both. It's going to definitely call for decisions. And that time, we're just getting a glimpse into it right now. I'm sorry to report to you that on Friday the 13th, I'm telling you, it's not going to get better and better and better until Christ comes back. What does Scripture tell us? In the old King James language, you know, it will wax worse and worse. And it gets so bad, Jesus Christ tells us, that it's never been anything like it on the face of the earth. And only Jesus and his return is worthy to straighten things out. I would love to tell you that um, there's going to be this wonderful rapture that comes in and we're spared and um, only those pitiful people are left behind. But what does scripture tell you every single time? It compares us to wheat. What do you do when you harvest a wheat crop? Thresh it. What does that mean? You beat it. You beat it and then you sift it. Jesus said, told Peter, he warned him, you will be sifted like wheat. Uh, he also told him who would be doing that. But what does Jesus promise? I will gather the wheat into my barn. So you have to make your decision. Do you want this now? Unlike the... Um, series that came out with the books and the movies a few years back that was so popular, the Left Behind series, you know, there were bumper stickers, when the trumpet blows, I'm out of here, and, um, you know, I don't want to be left behind. And but what does the Bible say? And go back to Daniel 2, World History 101 tells us what happens when you beat, thresh the wheat, what gets blown away? The chaff, the fluff and nonsense. What's actually left behind is the wheat, the stuff of substance. So I think we're the ones left behind. When Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days. That's when he's coming back. Pre-wrath of God, because we are not subject to God's wrath, but unfortunately, we are subject to Satan's wrath and his 
influential agent, Antichrist. Know what prophecy says, understand what God's plans are, and get with the program. Learn it, understand it, watch for it. Jesus said watch, not aimlessly look. Do you know what to watch for, or are you just aimlessly looking? Some people believe he can come at any moment, and that's the theory of imminence. His, his return is imminent. Just There's nothing left. That's not. Jesus gave us a list of signs. Some are concurrent, some are sequential, but they're a list of signs. And you look at those and see. Study your prophets. Study your prophecy. But first, pray to God for understanding. Then study. Open up your mind to what others believe and see how that fits in. I always say that prophecy is like a children's dot-to-dot -dot book. I loved those as children. You connect one to two to three to four, and then you see the big picture. That's what God has done with prophecy. Each prophecy is a dot on the page. The only problem is it doesn't come with numbers. You have to pray for discernment, for understanding, so that you can connect those dots in a sensible manner. We know that Psalm 83 has not been fulfilled yet. Some people will tell you, yes, it's been fulfilled. Some will tell you it was fulfilled in 70 A.D. I don't know why. Some will tell you it was fulfilled in 1948 when Israel was attacked. Some will tell you it was filled in um, 1967 during the uh, Six-Day War. But notice what the end of that psalm says. At the end it says, So that those nations that attacked Israel will know that the Lord God of Israel is the most high God of all the earth. Are the nations that immediately surround Israel today, do they know that Israel's God is the God of all the earth? No, no they, they do not. So that has not been fulfilled. I want to suggest to you that we have looked at Psalm 83 maybe short-sightedly. It is not a once and done, a battle, and it's over. I want to suggest to you that Psalm 83 is a little different from our other prophecies, that it is an ongoing saga that starts and takes us through the seven years. That 70th seven. It takes us into Isaiah 17, the prophecy where Damascus is blown off the face of the earth. That's coming. That may call for um, immediate peace in the Middle East because it certainly sounds nuclear. Um, it takes us through to Ezekiel 38:39. Now remember the, the conflicts here, the aims, the goals of the people in Psalm 83, the immediate surrounding enemies of Israel are to possess the land, to possess the pastures of God. They resent the fact that Israel is a nation. They want that land for themselves. But the goals... The aims of Ezekiel 38, 39 are quite different. It's to take a spoil, to have riches. What has been discovered in recent, very recent years in the Golan Heights? Tremendous amount of natural gas, tremendous amount of oil. And let's not... Um, overlook the copper scroll and the priestly garments and the treasures of the ancient temple that they won't allow to be dug until a peace treaty is signed. There are all sorts of um, financial interests 
and Russia is involved in that one because they don't have the oil. They need Middle Eastern oil. Golan Heights is very wealthy in gas and oil. So think of Psalm 83 as going along with the time of Antichrist. It begins with him and that seven years and endures throughout that seven years, introducing other prophets. Um, before we end tonight, I do want to encourage you to come to tomorrow's lesson. When is that, 1.30 tomorrow? We'll finish um, our introduction to Islamic eschatology and the image of the beast, because I do think that's very important that you understand um, the image of the beast, which is towards the end of chapter 13. I want you to understand there will be an antichrist who will appear at the beginning of this last seven years. There will be a peace treaty. He will come from the Middle East. And it looks to me, certainly, that he will be Islamic. Uh, 